This isn't a war, said the artilleryman. It never was a war, any more than there's war between man and ants. H.G. Wells, The War of the World, There is no war. There is only the harvest. Leviathan, Mass Effect 3, Beware, For I am fearless, and therefore powerful. Victor Frankenstein, Frankenstein, We cannot live through this. Mankind cannot live through this. In a single day they have covered this planet with a flood of living blades and needle fanged mouths. Kill one, and ten take its place. If they are truly without number, then our race is doomed to a violent death before every shred of our civilization is scoured away by a force more voracious than the fires of hell themselves. Death, by the machine god, death is here. The last words of Margos Varnak. An alien threat has risen from beyond the abyss, a swarm so vast that it blots out the stars. This horror fights neither for power nor territory, but rather to feed a hunger so insatiable that it will eventually devour the entire galaxy. Inquisitor Crippman. Imagine a minuscule flea, so small that it's barely visible. Why is it they bite humans who tower over them without a single thought to their own safety? Would you call their behavior courageous? Of course not, it's hunger compelling them. I will tell you what courage is, Jojo. Courage is to look your fear in the eye and know that it has no dominion over you. Will A. Zeppeli, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Fucking bugs, get off my lawn, the Emperor, presumably. Om nom nom. The Tyranids often shorten to simply nids are a race of extragalactic alien locust in Warhammer 40k, that seemingly exist only to devour biomass. Evolve into a more perfect species and grow in numbers. They are extremely adaptable, and frequently engineer and modify traits and characteristics in their genome, by devouring other unfortunate species into their own, in order to improve their combat effectiveness and survival. As a result, they are constantly evolving and becoming more dangerous. The Tyranids are most commonly seen in the galaxy in the form of hive fleets. Large collections of spacefaring organisms that are capable of transporting and birthing the smaller strains of the species, as they travel from world to world attack and consume all biomass on that planet, leaving it a lifeless rock. Even bacteria and archaea are consumed from the atmosphere. They are probably one of the oldest races when you think about it, and are, together with orcs and necrons if they don't nom the orcs and maybe destroy the necrons, probably going to win this galactic war. For this reason pretty much every faction in the galaxy sees Tyranids as the ultimate threat and would ally even with their sworn enemies to fight them. Thus the race is called the Great Devourer. They're named after Planet Tyran, where they were first officially sighted by the Imperium. Overview. Before they arrived to this galaxy, the Tyranids were probably lying dormant in intergalactic space because there was nothing there to consume probably. Despite this, they had sentinel organisms, looking constantly for any sign of life in distant galaxies. We actually don't know how many galaxies they have already left bare. Most of the facts behind their origin and backstory that we have on them are simply not more than speculation and conjectures. It could be that we have only seen a fraction of their numbers, or that said current numbers are all there is. We simply don't know. The Tyranids have hibernated until they were triggered by, and attracted to, concentrated sources of psychic energy like moths to a light bulb. One of them was the Astronomicon, the psychic signature of the Emperor of Mankind spanning throughout the entire galaxy. Also, in the 30k Horus Heresy era, an alien device known as the Pharos on the ultramarine realm planet of Sotha sent up a huge psychic energy pulse. Effectively giving the Milky Way a big neon sign that called it an all-you-can-eat buffet note that this is only known to the reader, the multitude of characters in the 30k and 40k eras had no inkling of just what was coming nor who or what actually called them. Thus the Tyranid set off taking roughly the next 10,000 years to do so, but just who would be insane or evil enough to summon such an apocalyptic force of alien nature to the Milky Way? A pretty cool guy who had no idea about what he would eventually call it a dinner, actually. Still, the possibility that the Tyranids are retreating from something more terrifying than even them remains open as of now. The Tyranid species is mentally connected and controlled by the extremely powerful and near godlike hive mind. The hive mind is the collective consciousness of the entire Tyranid race, a psychic embodiment of Tyranid instincts and racial imperatives to devour and evolve. It is so powerful that its mere presence the shadow in the warp makes even sickers and chaos shit their metaphysical brains out in terror. The power of the hive mind is such that it casts a stifling influence over the warp in the area, and therefore, warp travel becomes almost impossible, hence it is that a world that finds itself a target of a hive fleet is unable to call for help or receive reinforcements by the time it detects the hive fleet's presence. 
This super consciousness allows their forces to move with a unity of purpose and cohesion that makes them extremely dangerous. The individual intelligence of different strains of the species is variable, however, and many of the smaller species lack the psychic power to communicate over long distances, and so the swarm relies on larger organisms, the so-called synapse creatures, to act as relays and communication nodes in the psychic network if the hive mind is the internet internet, then synapse creatures are ice psi synapse and routers router warriors. Outside of the range of a synapse creature, such as a tyrannid warrior or a hive tyrant, Smaller varieties such as those found within the gaunt genus revert to animalistic behavior. However, certain strains, such as the genus Stealer or the Lictor, are designed to be able to spend long periods of time beyond the reach of the hive mind, and are consequently considerably more intelligent and autonomous than other tyrannid organisms. The normal tyrannid modus operandi is to locate a delicious looking planet, usually by following the psychic emanations of vanguard organisms like the genus Stealers who are sent ahead as scouts to infiltrate and form cults while obtaining genetic information about the local species hence the name Gene Stealer, drawing the fleet towards a viable target. The Tyranids are capable of non-warp based FTL travel, which they achieve by using gravity to manipulate spacetime and travel extremely quickly towards large gravity wells such as stars. And once they are relatively close, they must rely on STL travel to close the gap with their target. Once they reach the world, Infinite swarms of creatures flood down to the surface to overwhelm all resistance and consume the planet's population and resources in a manner reminiscent of a Korean StarCraft champion performing. The devastating Zerg Rush note that the Zerg were supposedly based on Tyranids, which in turn were based on aliens and from movies like Starship Troopers and Alien. All these organisms are based on eusocial hive insects such as the Order Hymenoptera, which includes ants, bees etc. In the later stages of the invasion, the fleet manipulates the planet's biosphere and seeds it with aggressive plant life that grows extremely rapidly and assimilate all nutrition life left on the planet, which is then consumed by the creatures of the swarm and massive feeding tentacles tubes, dropped by tyrannid bioships in low orbit, and hence conveyed to the high fleet as a whole. The fleet literally grows in size and mass, and moves on to the next planet. This makes the tyrannids a very dangerous foe to fight. Even the Imperial Guard and Orcs will find it difficult to beat them in a war of attrition, as individual losses are meaningless to the bugs accurately griblies according to Warhammer 40k official Facebook. As long as they are able to recover the biomass of the dead, it is simply recycled into new warriors and ships. It's worth noting that going against technological species, results in fewer and fewer recycled biomass, so a hive assaulting a high-tech heavily fortified fortress loses some of its total biomass bit by bit, but there are only few cases where the tyrannids really bite off more than they can chew. Even a high fleet that has taken terrible losses and is forced to retreat, may soon return to terrorize strong world, as capturing and consuming a few poorly defended backwater planets is all that is required for them to replenish their forces. Even high fleets considered defeated by the Imperium may still be dangerous, as the splinter elements that have survived may continue to infest worlds in the region. It is worth noting that, in the rare event that two different Tyranid fleets encounter each other, they are apt to attack each other. This is generally believed to be some sort of Darwinian selection mechanism to compare the competitiveness of the trays the individual fleets have accumulated, with the victorious fleet consuming the other, absorbing their best trays, and culturing a deadly hybrid with the best of both worlds. So far, only fragments of Tyranid Hive fleets have made it to this galaxy and they were given monstrous names such as Behemoth and Leviathan and eight untold numbers of planets before finally being destroyed or stalled. It's also known that these are merely scouting fleets for the unimaginably large swarm that has yet to arrive. Still currently in transit from another galaxy Imperial scholars suppose them to be either en route from a galaxy they successfully scoured of all life, or retreating from some force even nastier than they are. Noted Imperial scholars believe that the only possible plan that stands any chance against the arrival of this force involves giving a melter gun to everyone that has hands and praying to the God Emperor for the best. They have been expected to arrive on Terra's doorstep any day now for years, being stalled by a force even more malicious than they are GW's refusal to move the story forward, and if they intend to retcon the above so that Leviathan is in fact the main force, they can easily write it off as ravings of a crazed inquisitor. Following in the footsteps of the high fleets before it, Leviathan has been destroyed at bail by the Blood Angels and the Ultramarines, apparently with a little help from Kabandha the Bloodthirster. 
Admittedly, that campaign only involved the Tendril not engaged in war with the Orcs on Octarius, meaning that there may be significant elements of the fleet still roaming around the galaxy. However, since GW has been officially referring to this as the fall of Leviathan, it's probably safe to say that Leviathan 2 is now splintered like Behemoth and Kraken. Of course, this still isn't good news for the rest of the galaxy, because there are four new hive fleets in the neighborhood, one of which has apparently dedicated itself to vacuuming up all the splinter fleets left behind by Kraken, Behemoth, and Leviathan, thus gaining all their tasty biomass and DNA. This new high fleet is known as Kronos, after the Greek titan who fathered the gods, and with warp rifts and chaos demons now running amok in the galaxy. The hive mind has turned it towards a previously untapped niche fixing the mess left by chaos. Its take on the shadow in the warp is one of a complete and total hahaha <laughs> fuck you towards the ruinous powers, capable of smothering psychic abilities of any kind, causing demons to wither in its presence and closing chaos portals and small warp rifts just by proximity. In other words, chaos energy is arguably the most malevolent, most corrupting, most powerful force in the galaxy, and the hive mind has produced a hive fleet with the primary mandate of telling it to shut up and go to its room. On a smaller note, thanks to the devastation of Baal, it has been confirmed that tyrannid troops and monsters aren't even singular organisms. Instead, each is a collection of symbiotic species working in tandem with one another to create a killing machine. Tyrannid blood? A living parasite? Tyrannid weapons? Well, that's self-explanatory. Tyrannid organs? A separate critter that could survive just as easily outside of its hosts when it is needed to swap giblets. This means that those giant high fleets you see aren't just one massive creature, but a multitude of smaller creatures working as one this has some basis in real life biology. Colonial organisms such as the Portuguese Man O' War are composed of multiple interdependent organisms. This realization kind of solves some of the bizarre looking tyrannids that would be biologically impossible, but isn't actually much of a big deal, since most living things are technically made up of a collection of cells which are living things unto themselves. Tyrannid creatures can then be thought of as multi-bodied organisms, the same way we are multicellular organisms, only our various organs, tissues, and limbs can't be freely transplanted with no rejection issues across similar bioforms individuals. It remains to be seen whether this new backstory element will retcon some earlier reveals about the Tyranids. Such as their observed tendency to throw themselves into digestion pools to recycle themselves into raw materials when they are too damaged to fight or no longer tactically useful. For one thing, why bother reducing Tyranids into liquid biomass that requires precious time and energy to be remade into new bioforms from the cells up? When the hive mind can skip a step and conserve its resources by simply tearing out reusable organs and bioweapons from crippled or unneeded bioforms. And then install or graft those organic parts into new or less damaged bioforms, while throwing only the bare skeletons and the two damaged parts into the digestion pools for recycling? For another thing, if this becomes widespread knowledge among the Imperia, will it become the new standard procedure to either completely vaporize or thoroughly incinerate tyrannid corpses whenever possible? so as to keep the hive mind from reusing this grisly salvage should tyrannid forces take the field or advance their battle lines far enough to retrieve those corpses? All we can say for certain is, prepare yourselves for another round of the evolutionary arms race. Daka Daka Daka. Who doesn't love a scuttling swarm of space locusts? Chaos and tyrannids. It's an interesting fact to note that while the warp affects both flora and fauna, the Tyranids are notably highly resistant, if not outright immune, to its influence. When the Hive Fleet invading Bale got sucked into the warp by Cabanda's entrance, the Hive ships that emerged from this elsewhere were noted to have suffered little to no mutation when examined. Tyranids stuck in space hulks that spent centuries and the warp more or less got out unchanged, with no chaotic influences or mutations. Hell, even Jenna Steelers who are designed to operate independently from the hive mind, suffer no ill effects from warp exposure, still utterly devoted to the swarm after all that time. Additionally, when pitted against demons like the Quadrifold Abominatum, the Tyranids are outright disruptive to them due to their warp smothering powers, preventing demons from mustering their full strength when under a large enough fleet. Consuming tainted chaos flesh also does not seem to have any real negative effect on them. Both sides have a mutual disdain for each other, though, and do their best to stay out of each other's way unless forced into a confrontation. The nibs hate fighting chaos due to their use of demons, which has no biomass to harvest. 
Chaos hates the Nids for having no emotions to feed upon, so their conflicts with them are ultimately about as productive as fighting non-sapient wildlife. Whether this is due to their shadow and the warp that prevents warp entities from doing any real effect on them, or the specific design of another god entity we've yet to meet, is unclear. On the table. Second edition. Printed in the ancient past of 1995, the first Tyranid Codex brought the hive mind to the tabletop of 40k and instantly won over the hearts of a thousand vile Xeno lovers, or not. It's hard to tell as most of those original fans have since moved on to collect power armor armies or died from several decades of soul-crushing disappointment. Either way, the Codex was notable for including both Genestela cults and Tyranids in the same book. It was at this point in the Tyranids history that the army was at its most but fuckingly ultra rapid rip and tearing form. Tyranids were the fucking army that could go toe to toe with other cheese like the Elder or March of Metallic Doom and tear them a new asshole. Naturally this made them the army for players to spur on about how they were completely overpowered and countered armies like the Space Marines and General Imperial factions with complete ease. And then one of those fuckers was given a job at GW and it all went downhill from there for the space bugs. An image of the original appearance of Tyranids. Why yes, that thing has a dick. No, we don't know why. Kablooey, 3rd edition. Six years after the 2nd edition codex came out, a new one burst onto the scene in 2001. Again, not much is remembered from this time, aside from the fact the strong and fast Tyranids from the 2nd edition were turned into slow, clumsy beasts, a move that nerfed them into oblivion. It was also notable for introducing silly looking metal miniatures that vanish soon afterwards like the ever popular Grinfex and cool new plastic ones that are still used to this day. This codex was extremely limited, but did feature some interesting rules for customizing your models. None of these would last a 4th edition, but the nostalgia would linger for a long time after. 4th edition. In 2005, a new Tyranid codex emerged along with an entire host of redesigned units and metal kits. It was at this point that the modern designs for the Lictor, Genestealers, Raveners, and Hive Tyrants were introduced. Also, the first plastic Carnifex kit was released, and GW capitalized by giving the unit a cubic metric shit ton of options. Indeed, this was the theme of 4th edition mids. The codex deliberately axed 3rd edition characters like Old One Eye or the Red Terror in favor of giving players a wealth of options for customizing their models. Want a Hive Tyrant with a 2 save? Go ahead. Want a Carnifex with a better BS? There you go. None of this would last into 5th edition and the flaws were pretty glaring as time went by. Nid simply did not have the tools nor the depth of an army designed to succeed against every opponent, and many of the options turned into expensive traps. 5th edition. When the 5th edition codex released, it was met with split opinions, as usual. Some were angry at how overpowered the army looked, citing the fact that the Tervigan could create more units out of thin air using broken special rules, that the anti sicker powers were so broad, and that the Hive Gardens or Anthropes were so good at tank hunting at a time when tanks were king. However, after some time passed, people who decried the cheesy aspects of the army faded from view as people began to realize the army only seemed cheesy on paper, and that, in truth, any cheese the army had was drowned in the army's drawbacks. The Termagants the Tervigan could spawn? Stats like a guardsman in close combat, but with half their weapon range and weaker armor. And to get Tervigans to the troops slot from the HQ slot where they were practically useless, you had to pay guardsman prices for a unit of them. In other words, you had to use the cheesy special rule or they were overpriced into uselessness. Then there were the special powers that supposedly buffed the army. Again, at a first glance, they looked broken. Certain upgrades allowed any unit within 6 inches of certain models to gain rules like feel no pain, furious charge, poison, cover saves, and so on. It sounded like a serious boon, but it had a funny effect. Aside from the fact that most Tyranid models are too expensive unless you capitalize on the bubble buffs, it also does a horrible thing to your freedom to play the army. Mainly, it forces players to keep all their units bunched up within 6 inches of a few key models requiring them to spend the entire game in a rigid formation that can spell disaster for the army when broken. Tyranids already suffered from this problem somewhat due to their synapse rules, but the 6 inches range on the mandatory buffs only shortened the leash. Not to mention it also made blasts even worse for an army already vulnerable to them. Tyranids do seriously lack effective long-range support as well, 
While they possess some weapons capable of mincing infantry units, most things with a range over 12 inches come at a premium. With an army so focused on close combat this shouldn't be such a problem, but synapse and buff leashes actually make it a valid concern. Mainly, the short buff leash pressures a player into a castle formation, but the lack of medium and long ranged weaponry pressures the player to advance the entire castle towards the enemy. Which has a way of creating chinks in the formation. And you can't just move a few key units, when a unit moves forward, the model providing the buffs has to follow them. And then the other units relying on the buffs have to follow the model providing the buffs, it just makes the army obscenely inflexible. Tyranid monstrous creatures, their heavy support, also got drastically nerfed in the 5th edition update. The Tyranifix, for example, has a 2 save and 6 wounds at a toughness of 6. The damn thing is almost indestructible, but the weapons are short range, and if you buy it an expensive long range cannon to shoot at tanks, you can't change any of its other short ranged weapons which are designed to kill infantry. You just can't quite kit your heavy support to do the things you specifically want. Which brings us to the final problem on top of mountains of tactical inflexibility. The Tyranids also suffer from the drawback of design inflexibility. Unlike Guardsmen or Space Marines, the Tyranids don't get a lot of options to change the way the army works. When you buy Hormogorts, you get them at face value, you can't equip them with frag grenades, give them pistols, add heavy weapons, or mess with their gear in any way. You can buy them the poison special rule if you want, or maybe the furious charge special rule, but those are your two choices. Almost the entire army is that way, which is vastly different than the way they worked in 4th edition. The Carnifex alone lost 18 weapon and biomorph options between 4th and 5th edition and it doubled in points value. And with no upgrades taken. And for 20 points more, you can get a Trigon, which is better than the Carnifex in almost every way, except looking good. It's possible that Tyranids are now the least adaptable army in the game. The last kick in the teeth is that Tyranids are one of the more expensive armies to collect, requiring a larger number of models than most. Their HQ choices, short of the Tyranid Prime, are big monsters which run at prices edging nearer and nearer to 100 each. For the fact that most Tyranid armies will play exactly the same way, having all the same exploitable weaknesses and no unique war gear surprises. It's not a wonder that the army has seen a huge drop in sales since the release of their 5th edition codex. The shorter lesson to take from all this is, if you're thinking about beginning a 40k army, even with how expensive it's all gotten, Tyranids are not the best army to start with. The one good legacy of the 5th edition codex was the radical expansion of the army list. The previous codex had featured the addition of a single new unit the Broodlord and the removal of two special characters. Both were brought back for the 5th edition codex and the total units jumped from 15 to 34. While several of the characters the Doom of Melante and the Parasite of Mortrex did not survive past this codex, many others did and eventually grew into popular options in their own right. 6th edition. Weeeeeee. The fail train has no brakes. It also turns out that not everyone played Space Marines contrary to popular belief. Is it me? Or does the Haruspex look like it belongs in a bad hentai movie? This abortion of a codex was so bad that GW stock crashed by 23%. After several years of having only a few viable units, virtually everything the Tyranids needed to stay competitive was either removed or nerfed to uselessness. Tyranids no longer had Macetic Spores, the Doom of Melante. Imgaral Genestealers or the Parasite of Mortrex GW lost a court battle with Chapter House Studios and simply deleted all their models from the game. They even lost the ability to use psychic powers from the Biomancy table along with their hive mind powers being nerfed. Why GW thought that the most underpowered army needed even more nerfing will remain a mystery, but odds are that Crades had something to do with it. A perfect example of unnecessary nerfing is the Tyranid Prime. It was rarely fielded in 5th edition, and the 6th edition codex inexplicably increased its cost by over 56%. To compensate for their failure, G-Dubs released some data slate formations which allow you to ignore the force organization chart and spam flying monstrous creatures to overwhelm an opponent's anti-air defenses because the flyer rules are an even bigger catastrophe than the Tyranid codex. SSSS Rippers will be put in Crudfus's beds for what he has done to us. 7th edition, DLC, and White Dwarf updates. G-Dubs finally noticed how badly nerfed Tyranids have been during the last edition so they took opportunity to get your money by releasing new waves of Tyranid units supported by White Dwarf. Updates. Things started poorly with a pair of monstrous creatures who really didn't bring anything new to the table. 
The Toxicrine was fine on paper, bringing Poison to instant death on a 6 attacks, but as yet another flute slogging MC had had trouble catching the things it wanted to kill. The Malaceptor was just an overcosted, overcomplicated, and underpowered hunk of plastic that would be lucky to kill more than 20 points worth of models in a given turn. But then things got interesting. The Mesetic Spores came back, under the name of Tyrannocytes, and they were well worth the wait. Alongside the new spores were a Tyranid fortification that is, a heavy support that didn't take up a force org, slot that could boost synapse range and drop spore mines around, and a new supersized mucilloid spore mine that could assault flies. Soon afterward came the doom of Melante in a new body the Neurothrope. While slightly nerfed, his signature fuck you bubble is now a psychic power rather than just free damage, it's far from unusable and can even be put in a squadron to make lookouts rolls. The most unexpected announcements came from GW around fall 2014, coinciding with the coming of the end times new models for the Tyranids. The first pack that was announced was a dual kit for the Maliceptor and Toxicrine. While the Maliceptor proved to be unpopular within minutes of having its rules announced in White Dwarf as it was an overpriced drain of warp charges, the Toxicrine proved to fare a bit better. As the copious amount of poison and instant death on a 6 to wound using said poison made it a menace against monstrous creatures though its intended targets, the Riptide and Wraith Knight. Merely scoffed at it because they are jumping monstrous creatures, and thus able to kite it like a toy. The second release proved to be the most popular by far, the return of Mesetic Spores now Tyrannocytes, the living fortifications known as Spore Assists, and new Mucolid Spores that not only assault flyers, but are also the cheapest troop choices making starting an army of Tyranids a much simpler task. While the Tyrannocyte proved an incredible weapon that made several units including the infamous Pyravor suck slightly less, that power came with a hefty price tag for a transport, not as a monstrous creature, and spore assists are completely immobile and are equally pricey in exchange for synapse bonuses and the ability to spam spore mines. Needless to say, People actually thanked G-Dubs for this rare show of intelligence the third release gave new sprues for the Zoanthrope Venomthrope as a multi-part kit with a new set of rules for the Zoanthropes. The Neurothrope, a sergeant that gave the brood a new power that could potentially give them more warp charges to spend on warp lance. Not bad, but the new sprue was still welcome. After these releases, it became clear as to why the Nids got new shit. Promotions for a new campaign called Shield of Baal, which involves Nids chomping through a system near the territory of the Blood Angels. Meaning that Dante has to call all the successor chapters to stop the mob. He had to take help from Anrika to save even part of the system. This now concludes the awesome part of all things Tyranid. If you look at the gallery below the Cutenids, you will require a mind scrubbing and be lobotomized into a servitor. No exceptions. Of course you now have players mocking Nids as being a DLC faction. Return in 8th edition. Tyranids have returned with a vengeance. Tyranids are one of the early middle released codex of 8th and has become one very powerful army mostly due to how fast they are. Like my Hormagons just move 20 in one turn and my stratagem can give them a second movement phase fast. This speed has given them absolutely amazing board control combined with their easy access to deep striking units. Good mix of swarms which is very important in 80 and big monsters for heavier damage and the absolute cheese that are biovores. Conifixes have also gotten a bunch of their biomorphs back. They are now excellent and cheap Swiss army knives that you can insert into almost any role, but for all their buffs, they still have their weak points. Tyranids, while being ostensibly a melee focused army, tend to suffer from relatively low strength melee attacks which compensate for their lowered wound chance by having higher damage. This means that while they deal a lot of damage when they wound a vehicle it's a toss up as to whether or not they can actually wound it, space marines have easier access to anti-tank melee than us. Some of the big beasties are still overcosted and underpowered for their roles, and the flyers aren't too good either. While the little guys are at their worst may and our big guys are either very good or just suck, the mid-sized ones are decent but tend to require some planning to make the most of them. Lictors are fragile but are useful as deep strike beacons. Warriors and raveners are a bit overcosted but can stick around much longer than before now that instant death is gone. And zoanthropes are stuck as the obligatory smite spammers. So look, I say this every time I do a 1d4chan article, go ahead and get lost in 1d4chan. It is by far the best source of 40k lore that's available on the internet 
I think it's amazing. Um, I love the way all the articles are really digestible, and it just sounds like, you know, you're sitting talking to your mate when you're sitting reading it. Now, of course, they are taking the piss, and not all of it's, like, super, super accurate. If you want that type of stuff, go to Black Library or go for the codexes. But, like, I enjoy it. I think it's a lot of fun, and it's one of the ways how I got myself back into 40k by sitting reading the articles, like, you know, and I love it. I really enjoy it. So, like, if it's something you're into, if you enjoyed this, Go ahead, links below, go ahead, check them out. It's so worth it, honestly, because you could spend weeks or months or possibly even years and you'll never, (laughs) never be finished with them, you know? So that's definitely something to check out if you ever get the chance to. But uh, no, when it comes to Tyranids, I've never been the biggest fan of them, though I do feel a level of kinship with them, seeing as my main army is Dark Elder and uh, Dark Elder and Tyranids have had a somewhat similar lifespan with codexes and yeah they haven't always been great but like you know like if you're into them and you enjoy the lore you you can go along with them and because you do not see them on the tabletop as much as other armies you can actually pull a few things off because people just aren't prepared to deal with them because they are just so different you know so that's what i would say although i would say tyranids haven't had the greatest of time but I think they're on the rise again, and especially with Gene Stewart Cult, which is something that we haven't touched on at all. I'll probably do that next. I really, I'm definitely more of a Gene Stewart Cult fan than actual Tyranids, even though they're the exact same thing. But look, um, I love yous and leave you so well. I hope you guys enjoyed. Subscribe and definitely go ahead, check out 1D4chan. Stuff's fucking top notch, you know? So I've recently moved Nick Badia merch over to Teesprings and have a few new designs. Listings are below the video and in the description. So I am an affiliate of NordVPN. If you have been thinking of getting a VPN with everything going on at the minute, NordVPN is offering 75% off a 3 year plan. I have been using Nor myself for a few years now because it helps support a lot of the people I like to watch on YouTube and I think it's pretty cool they have let me become an affiliate. So check out norvpn.org forward slash nickbeardier and use coupon code nickbeardier for 75% off while the offer is on. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Child Protective Services, it's time to stop!